It is now time for oral questions. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question uh, to the Premier. Premier, and following up on yesterday's questions where I called upon you to uh, keep your promise to the people of uh, Scarborough when it comes to the subway that you had promised during the by-election. Um, yesterday, I know you met with uh, TTC Chair uh, Karen Stins, who had a very similar viewpoint that I did. So if I didn't convince you, hopefully Councillor Stintz did. Simple question, Premier. Will you keep your promise to the people of Scarborough from the by-election and build that subway just as Council asked? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, our commitment to the people of the GTHA and beyond has been to build transit, and we are doing that, and we will keep that commitment, Mr. Speaker. We have committed that we have $1.4 billion plus another $320 million, Mr. Speaker, that we commit to building a subway in Scarborough. That commitment is on the table. We will move forward with that, Mr. Speaker. And quite frankly, uh, I have to say Karen Stintz has been an advocate for transit. She has been an advocate for transit all along, which, Mr. Speaker, is actually not the case of the party opposite. The party opposite has not supported us on building transit because, as you know, there are many, many projects going on around the province, Mr. Speaker. We have not had the support of the official opposition. I'm glad to see now that they are interested in building transit, and I look forward to working with them as we make those investments that are so necessary for the economic well-being and growth of the uh, GTHA and the province. Sir, thank you. Supplementary. Well, let's be direct about the record, uh, Speaker. Uh, Leslie Frost built the Young Subway, Robarts built the Bloor Line, Bill Davis extended the Bloor Line, lengthened to Young to North York. I was on a roll, Speaker. Mike Harris built the Shepherd Line. The number of subway stops the Liberals have built in Toronto, zero. The number of PCs have built, 64. Speaker, 64. All we're asking, Premier, you said you're going to be different than Dalton McGinsey. Will you keep your promise to the people of Scarborough, or are you going to weasel off the head? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, that was an interesting litany of, uh, of investing in subway. We stopped at the Eglinton line. At the uh, member from Prince Edward Hastings come to order. The member from the PM Carlton come to order. The member from Renfrew come to order. Oh, you didn't think I missed you, did you? Premier. Since we came into office in 2003, we've been investing in transit. We will continue to invest in transit. We will keep our commitment to the people of Scarborough to build the subway in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker. And that $1.4 billion will go into building that line, Mr. Speaker, on the alignment that has been the alignment all along in the plan. That's the conversation that I had with, uh, with Councillor Stintz yesterday. We will continue to uh, make that investment, Mr. Speaker, and I hope we'll be able to work with the uh, City Council in order to do that, because the people of Scarborough need that transit. We need to make I'm that sorry? investment in order for in order for the people of Scarborough to be able to have the uh, access to their work and to their uh, schools that they need, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. The Liberals may talk a good game. They may talk about subway stops. They may announce subway stops. Speaker, after 10 years of Liberal government, additional Liberal subway stops, zero. And here's what I worry about. You made a promise in the by-election. Now you're trying to wiggle off the hook of that promise. It's clear. And you set out your transportation minister, who, quite frankly, has the stability of a ball and a roulette wheel popping around, but gambling on a subway, that's a hell of a risk. Why don't you actually stick to the plan, the city plan, the original plan, build it from Kennedy, Scarborough Town Centre to Shepherd? It's the right thing to do. Please keep your promise. Don't pull a Dalton McGinty. Don't flip-flop. Do what you said you were going to do. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, and I know that the leader of the opposition knows that uh, the people who are going to be using the extension of the, Spadi uh, the Spadina line, Mr. Speaker, are very excited about the opening of that line. I know that the leader of the opposition knows because he actually lives quite 
close to the, the work that's being done on Eglinton Avenue, holes that will not be filled in, Mr. Speaker. Those, those holes are actually going to function, and we're going to have the Eglinton Crosstown line because that's the investment that we have made, Mr. Speaker. One of, the, one of the issues that I talked about with Councillor Stintz yesterday was that the federal government has not come forward to put money into, into an expanded version of the line that, uh, that the City Council would like to see. And I, I, I said to Councillor Stintz, if she can find a way to, uh, to bring that money forward, then that's one thing. But the fact is, that money has not been forthcoming. We have made the commitment. We're the only level of government that has made that commitment, and we will stick to that commitment. $1.4 billion, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. No question. A member from the Port of Lake Shore. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is again for the Premier. Uh, ma Madam Premier, you uh, just said you, you met with uh, the chair of the TTC yesterday. Why didn't you meet with the chair of the TTC before you made your announcement? Here, here. Before you your plan? Here, here. Where's your communication now? Thank you. Premier. Transportation infrastructure. Thanks, uh, for transportation and infrastructure. Uh, I, I, I'm waiting for them to go back to Johnny McDonald and the railroad, Mr. Speaker. But you know, the reality is, uh, these new Tories haven't built a subway. That group never ever laid a line. That group, Mr. Speaker, only filled them in. And I have met with. I have met with. Thank you, Minister. Okay, thank you. And yes, I have had several meetings over the summer with Karen Stintz, my dear, uh, my dear friend over there, and uh, the last time we offered them $1.4 billion, the only money we had for a subway, the chair of the TTC answered us by declaring, while the press conference was going on, that it was dead on arrival, Mr. Speaker. She wouldn't take the money, she couldn't take yes for an answer, and failed to support a joint strategy to get the federal government to the table. I was just speaking to Mr. Kent, pointing out that Ms. Ray and Ms. LaBelle haven't met with me in Thank six you. months, Mr. Speaker. Your federal members won't have a conference. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Madam Premier, every time the Minister of Transportation opens his mouth, he either insults someone or releases a new plan. That's right. I wouldn't trust him to run a one-car funeral. <laughs> Premier, what I want to know is how do you plan on getting this transit built without the support of the TTC and the City of Toronto? Good question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I have great respect for the member off of the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore, but I, I think we disagree on one thing. His idea of subway building, Mr. Speaker, is to pass a motion. Ours is to write a check. And, Mr. Speaker, for we don't need to go back to 1867 or 1967. All we have to do is look at the record of the members opposite. Lots of motions, not a single check. Lots of, lots of subway stations closed, lines cancelled and filled in. This government has boring machines right now under Eglinton on the university line. We have more work. We have $16.4 billion, Mr. Speaker. We're the only party, the only government with serious money into this, 90% of the funding. They owe an apology to the people of Scarborough, Thank Mr. You. Speaker, for misleading them again. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, this plan is full of holes. There isn't the money here to do what's needed. They're counting on the City of Toronto to put up money, and they haven't even discussed the matter with them. Sure. They've also put forward a plan that the TTC says is not feasible technically. Terrible. Now, how in the world can you responsibly go to the people of Scarborough and tell them you've got a plan that you haven't even researched? Here, here. You see that, please? You see that, please? Stop the call. I, uh... I continue to uh, try to find the uh, decorum that uh, I continue to try to find the decorum that I seek. And uh, when I'm speaking, and having people have to use the earpiece means that others are speaking while I'm trying to make a point. Um, I've, I'll remind members that I do not like when members' names are used in the house. Uh, I want writings to be referred to, or titles to be referred to. 
It does not elevate the debate. It actually lowers it, and it becomes personal. So please stay on focus with what that request is. It'll help the decorum rise. Um, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we kind of like engineers. As a matter of fact, we like evidence and we like engineers. The, the Metrolink has a very competent set of engineers, and when proposals came forward, they were asked to, to evaluate them, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Collins and the Metrolink board have said very clearly that technology is feasible, this works. We did not ask City Council for a new plan or an alternative route. We said we want to stick with the existing route. We asked them whether they wanted an LRT or a subway. They said they wanted a subway. We said we will build the subway. We have a process called I-Corridor, the Ministry of Transportation. It is the most advanced engineering and planning tool, I think, in North America for planning it. It says that a subway doesn't make much sense. It actually, the original plan for LRT after Scarborough out to Shepherd is that. Answer. Well, Councillor Thompson and Minister Duguid are going to look at those issues as a thorough study and look at connectivity and take the time to do that. Yep. In the meantime, Mr. Speaker, we'll listen to the engineers. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Before the session began, New Democrats put our priorities on the table. We want to ensure that the results that people were promised are actually delivered, that home care times, wait times will go down, that youth unemployment will go down, that auto insurance rates go down, and that Queen's Park gets some new transparency from the Financial Accountability Office. But the Premier still hasn't set out an agenda, Speaker. She seems more interested in playing politics and making election threats than e that even she doesn't take seriously. Now, is the Premier going to keep playing games over issues she knows will be supported, or will she just get down to work? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's just uh, let's just be clear that today, in fact, there will be a vote on the issue of the Financial Accountability Office, Mr. Speaker. So we are moving ahead with those commitments that we made. And, Mr. Speaker, the comments that I made at the beginning of the week about wanting to find those areas where we could work together, all of us in this House, Mr. Speaker, to pass legislation to move ahead on issues where we could find agreement, like consumer protection, Mr. Speaker, as an example, like the financial. Accountability Office, that I thought that it was important that we identify those areas. There is lots of room for continued wrangling on other issues, but where there is agreement, it seemed to me, Mr. Speaker, that it would make sense for us to agree that we would move ahead on those issues. Yeah. That was my point at the beginning of the week. That remains my point, Mr. Speaker, and I, I am yes, pleased that we are moving ahead with, uh, with some of those issues. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Ontarians want to see their politicians focused on results for them, not on their own political interests. And that's why New Democrats are focused on creating jobs, improving health care, making life affordable, and making government accountable. There's a lot of work to do, Speaker, but the Premier seems much more interested in picking fights over legislation that we've already agreed to pass instead of focusing on the work that she needs to do here. Now, is the Premier ready to deliver on the commitments that she has made? Or can we expect more of the same political game playing? So, Mr. Speaker, part of the delivery on those results is making sure that we get legislation yeah, through right. the House. That's part of what I have to do, what we have to do as, as elected members to make sure that we can deliver on those results. So, you know, there are, uh, there are a number of bills moving forward, three bills moving forward this week, which I'm very pleased about. It's exactly what I was talking about. So, consumer protections, we've got all party support. The Leader of the Opposition uh, voted for it. That's a good thing. We're, um, we're moving ahead on the tanning bed legislation, Mr. Speaker, had all party support, and on the Financial Accountability Office, as I said. So, that's the point I was making. So I feel very, very good that we are able to move that legislation ahead for the very reason that the leader, leader of the third party identifies. We need to get results. We need to make sure yes, that sir. we act on those commitments, and that's what I'm committed to do, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. In the, in the lead up to the spring budget, uh, we made it pretty clear that we need a fair and balanced approach to balancing the books. And the government's plan to create a new $1.3 billion tax loophole for, loophole for corporations so they can write off the HST on whining and dying their client, clients was a cost that we just simply cannot afford here in the province. Now, the Premier and the Minister of Finance said that they'd take action on that file, but nothing has happened. If the Premier is looking for some priorities, 
That's one that people need her to deliver on. Speaker, why hasn't she made it a priority? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, here's here's an area where there's a there's a disagreement about what has happened or hasn't happened. We have actually, before the uh, leader of the third party started to ask these questions in the House, the finance minister had been in touch with the uh, with the federal government and had 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 raised this issue. He's also made the point repeatedly that it's not a loophole. It's nothing new, Mr. Speaker. It's the rollout of the uh, the HST. So so we did make it a priority and. I'm not saying that the third party didn't raise the profile of the issue. They did, and that's as it should be. But we have taken action. We cannot act unilaterally, and so the finance minister has taken the appropriate action by being in touch with the uh, with the federal government, and we will continue to pursue that. Thank you. New question, leader of the third party. Thanks very much, Speaker. My next question is also to the premier. People want to see their government deliver results, but all they see from the Liberals is more gains. We worked hard last spring to get some help for drivers paying the highest auto insurance rates in the country, and commitments were made in the budget, Speaker. But this is what people have seen, government working overtime to help insurance companies pad their bottom line while they're moving at a glacial pace when it comes to helping drivers get some fairness and some relief. Is the Premier ready to make this a priority, Speaker? Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've made it a priority. And the Finance Minister made it clear that we are acting on the, uh, the commitment to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 per cent. Mr. Speaker, it is easy to um, craft a sound bite about a complex issue, but I think it does a disservice to people to suggest that somehow the leader of the third party could snap her fingers and all of a sudden there would be an automatic 15 percent reduction across the province. That is not how insurance works, Mr. Speaker. The reality is there are costs in the system that need to be removed. We have, uh, we have issues of fraud in the system that need to be removed. We are working with the system to make sure that those costs are removed so that there can be a, a reduction across the province. And the fact is, it's an average reduction, Mr. Speaker, yes, across sir. the province. We will see that happen. We are working on making that happen, and that was our commitment, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, the, the government seems to snap their fingers and get the uh, auto insurance uh, industry some pretty good bonuses to their bottom line, but they can't seem to snap their fingers and help out consumers. Speaker, that's a bit of a problem. We're taking a step. We're taking a step towards future government accountability, Speaker, with the new Democrat plan for the Financial Accountability Office, but people are expecting real answers when it comes to the Liberal record on the gas plants. Now, the Premier insisted that the public inquiry wouldn't be needed because the committee would be able to get all questions answered, but this is what Ontarians have seen this week. Every time I've asked the if the Premier will support expanding the mandate of the Gas Plants Committee so we can ask Liberal insiders about their interference with the Speaker, she dodges that question. It's pretty simple. Will she do her part so Ontarians can get answers, or will she keep protecting senior Liberal insiders? So, Mr. Speaker, I thought we were talking about auto insurance, so <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to say something else about auto insurance, and then I will come to, uh, to this other question, which it seems like it's a different question. But um, I, I just want to make sure that the leader of the third party knows that uh, in a, a memo that was an internal memo in her wow. party yeah. on August 23rd, um, the statement was that about us, about the Liberals, we cannot truthfully say they've broken a promise. That's uh -huh. an NDP memo. So, so, Mr. Speaker, the reality is we're following through on our commitment. She knows it, Mr. Speaker. She knows that we are following through on what we said about auto insurance, and we will continue to do that. On the other issue, Mr. Speaker, I think I have answered the question many Answer. times. I'm open to having the questions asked, the questions answered that are asked at committee. Um. I, I tried to give uh, the member a little bit of leeway in the posing of the question in it relationship to the first question, and it didn't seem to match. So I'm going to uh, ask the member to stay focused on the original question in her final supplementary. The government's promises in getting results on the things that they've promised, they've been pretty consistent, so I'll continue on that vein. Um, and I, and I can't say to the Premier, uh, through you to the Premier Speaker, that um, 
Making a promise uh, is one thing, uh, but delivering, at, delivering it at a glacial, glacial, glacial place, uh, pace is uh, something uh, that we're quite worried about. And that's, I think, uh, something that Ontarians are worried about. Because what they're tired of uh, is, uh, is instead of their priorities taking uh, uh, precedence, uh, they're tired of political games taking precedence here, Speaker. They want their government to actually deliver results. And they want their government to actually be accountable. Now, will the Premier stop posturing, stop playing games, and get down to work by keeping the promises that she made in the budget? That was cute. I thank, I thank the member for that. Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to be clear. I want to be clear with the people of Ontario that we are acting on every single one of the commitments that we made in the budget, Mr. Speaker. Our work this fall is about making sure that we put those we put those commitments, those strategies in place. Over the summer, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment and the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities were working to make sure that the youth employment strategy was put in place, Mr. Speaker, that those funds were there, that that $295 million would be accessible for young people as they look for opportunities opportunities in the workforce, Mr. Speaker. The $100 million for um, roads and bridges and, and infrastructure in rural and northern communities, Mr. Speaker, we worked to make sure that those criteria are in place so that municipalities could apply for those funds. Those are the things that are going to make a difference to people. Answer. Those are the commitments that we're acting on, including the auto insurance. But, Mr. Speaker, every single one of the commitments that we made, we are taking action on. That's right. Thank you. New question. The member from Carleton, Mississippi North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, fairness is a two-way street act. We'll shut the door on Quebec contractors coming into Ontario. In spite of countless labour mobility agreements between Ontario and Quebec, Ontario contractors are stopped from working in Quebec while Quebec contractors have full access to the Eastern Ontario construction market. Ontarians want equal access to the Quebec construction market. Minister, numerous workers have expressed their growing frustration with this gross unfairness. Will you support Ontario workers by demanding that Quebec take down their barriers to Ontario construction contractors and workers coming to, into Quebec? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Labour. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I want to thank the honourable member uh, for the question. But, Speaker, our government is focused on creating more jobs for Ontarians, and the honourable member's bill would just do the opposite. Speaker, it will create trade barriers that will jeopardize Flint, uh, infrastructure pro Flint, projects in the province and hurt jobs not only in across the province but especially in the city of Ottawa. Speaker, what's been approached in terms of the private member's bill is the wrong uh, approach. We saw, we've, and it, Speaker, we've seen this bill before when the Harris Hudak government had the same bill before, and it did not work at that time. It resulted in a loss of jobs. It resulted in a court, in a court case which City of Ottawa lost as a result of that particular piece of legislation. Speaker, I. Uh remind you again that when somebody is answering from the answering side, there should be no noise and no noise on the other side. Please finish. I'm done. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Minister, the original Fairness is a Two-Way Street Act became law in 1999 to solve this worker mobility problem with Quebec. It was repealed in 2006 when the government signed the Agreement on Labour Mobility between Ontario and Quebec. Since 2006, the Quebec provincial government has reverted back to their old ways, creating a regulatory system designed to punish Ontarians by shutting Ontario contractors out of the Quebec construction market. Minister, will you and your Eastern Ontario colleagues support the construction workers of Eastern Ontario by voting for the Fairness is a Two-Way Street Act. Will you demand that Quebec open up their borders to Ontario construction workers? Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
Minister of Labor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, you know, don't take my word on on uh, the impact of fairness is a two-way street act. This is what the mayor of Ottawa had to say today. The previous legislation did not correct concerns about worker mobility, and the exact same legislation is unlikely to do so in 2013. Therefore, I could not support your private member's bill, and that is to the honourable member. But, Speaker, this is what John DeVries, the president of the Ottawa Construction Association, said. This is the Construction Association of Ottawa representing the industry. Bringing back the Fairness is a Two-Way Street Act is not a solution. In essence, Ontario was penalizing our workforce, not exactly the desired outcome. And lastly, Speaker, this is what Richard Hader from the Building Trades in Ottawa said about this Thank bill. You. This act certainly won't make the My, my question is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Last week, uh, the Minister blindsided everyone and announced an uncosted and technically challenged subway proposal. By acting unilaterally, this Minister and this Government have created unprecedented division and chaos in Scarborough transit planning. This action is setting back new transit in Scarborough, which is already a decade behind schedule. Why didn't the minister work with City Council and the TTC to get them on board so we can finally get some shovels in the ground in Scarborough? Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Councillor Thompson, who is the City Councillor in the area and the Chair of the Economic Development Committee, will be shortly convening a meeting with my colleague, uh, Minister Duguid, to address the planning and connectivity issues. Mr. Speaker, we look very carefully at this line, and it was not me. We have two ministries. The Ministry of Transportation went through i or looks at ridership, which we estimate, Mr. Speaker, I don't mean me, I mean the experts, about 10,000 riders on this portion of the line. There is not that level of ridership after the Scarborough Town Centre, and there isn't the evidence yet to justify a subway beyond that point. As a matter of fact, the original plan in the negotiations with the city seems to suggest that BRT and LRT and the other projects and that connectivity on the evidence, on the engineering, makes more sense. The person sowing chaos here is the member opposite and the party opposite who can't produce an option that's Answer. viable, nor can they support any funding, any revenue, and constantly undermine efforts to fund the, the subways that Scarborough, Scarborough folks want. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, <clears throat> Here's the support that the minister has for his uh, scheme uh, thus far. The CEO of the TTC says the plan is technically challenged. The chair of the TTC says the plan doesn't meet the city's transit objectives. Experts like Steve Monroe say the plan simply cannot be built for, uh, for $1.4 billion. This minister has no partners. The minister has insulted the people he needs to get this done. When will the Liberal government drop the hubris, get back to the uh, conversation, and build the relationships needed to move forward with transit? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, I don't, didn't develop I corridor. I'm not the executive vice president, Jack Collins, and his engineering team, who said this was feasible. Um, and I don't think Ms. Stentz or the member opposite is an engineer, and I'm not. So that was the ruling from Metrolinx. That was quite clear. This government would not proceed on, on something that wasn't engineeringly feasible and took great care to make sure that it was. A matter of fact, I released the other day, Mr. Speaker, I Corridor and GR Portal, which is the most advanced planning tools that looks at ridership and land use. And we have a highly with those of us who want to work with us. Mr. Speaker, when Ms. Stintz declared that the $1.4 billion was going to result on a plan that has no business plan. Mr. Flaherty and I are both waiting for the business plan on this Answer. alternate route that has never been seen anyone. We're actually sticking to the original route that has been researched, of which millions of dollars have been spent Thank on, you. Mr. Speaker. You're proposing a, a plan as we Thank pull you. over the air. So you please the member of the new question, the member from Scarborough Asian Court. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 
This summer, the government implemented changes in the way physiotherapy services are offered in Ontario. I understand that these changes were necessary to crack down on fraud and to improve access to physiotherapy for Ontarians in all parts of Ontario. Still, some of the seniors in my riding of Scarborough Agent Corps are worried that these changes can make physiotherapy services less accessible to them going forward. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she tell my constituents why these changes are necessary and also to reassure the seniors in my riding that they will continue to receive physiotherapy they need? Minister. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker, and uh, I'm uh, very grateful to the member from Scarborough Asian Court for this question because I do welcome the opportunity to clarify some of the issues around our changes to physiotherapy. I want to be very clear, Speaker, eligibility for physiotherapy has not changed. The people who were eligible before are still eligible. What has changed is our delivery model. And this, these changes will allow us to deliver physiotherapy to far more people and to, to uh, expand exercise programs and false prevention programs. Speaker, 200,000 more Ontarians will be able to access services as a result of these changes. We're doubling the number of physiotherapy clinics, Speaker, so people across the province, no matter where they live in this great province, will have access yes, to clinic-based physiotherapy. Uh, speaker, we're also bringing physiotherapy into family, uh, into family health care, so our uh, family health teams, nurse practitioner-led clinics, and so forth. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'm sure the many seniors in my riding will be delighted to hear the physical therapy services are being expanded, Mr. Speaker. I understand that there are many major changes to the way physical therapy is being delivered and built in over 40 years. And I know my constituents will be happy to hear that the government is modernizing the physical therapy in Ontario. But there are many seniors and other people who require physical therapy in Scarborough Agent Corner across Ontario who are worried that they will see interruption in their services as these changes are being implemented. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she tell the House what's being done to ensure those who are needing physical therapy service will continue to receive them? Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, speaker, uh, my, uh, my highest priority is to ensure that seniors get the services they need yeah. to stay healthy, mobile, and independent. We are working with LINS, with the Community Care Access Centres, with the community clinics and other partners to ensure a smooth transition to the model. Uh, speaker, I'm happy to provide an update to this House. Speaker, assessments are taking uh, place across the province. People are receiving physiotherapy under the new model. And, Speaker, this is very good news. Twelve of the 14 LINs have now eliminated the wait list for in-home physiotherapy. This is great new news. Speaker, more than 700 sites across this province have exercise programs and falls prevention programs in place. St. Hilda's uh, Tower in Toronto, for example, has falls prevention uh, classes. They started last Friday. Resident assessments are ongoing. Speaker, seniors are already benefiting, and as we expand this, yes, even more seniors will benefit from these changes. Thank you. Okay. New question. Uh, from Kirk Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier and Minister of Agriculture and Food. The 2012 Liberal budget, aided and abetted by the NDP, kicked the legs out of the, from under the horse racing industry. They did so with no consultation and no concern for the thousands of jobs that would be lost, mainly in rural Ontario. But the government did create three new part-time jobs for former cabinet ministers, and it also created work for consulting and communication firms. My question to the Premier, can she tell us what her government's horse racing industry transition panel has cost taxpayers so far? So, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the question. And uh, I know that the uh, the member opposite, because he represents a riding that is quite rural, and I know that he understands the importance of having a sustainable horse racing industry. I also know, Mr. Speaker, that he understands how much people like John Snowblin know about the horse racing industry, Mr. Speaker, and Elmer Buchanan and John Wilkinson. He knows how important it is that we have people with expertise giving us advice. Order. Attorney General. 
just when I'm going to nail them, you do something. <laughs> But I'm not going to nail them, but consider yourself nailed. <laughs> Premier. I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I, know that, I, know that the, uh, I know that the member opposite wants the horse racing industry to be sustainable. I've written a letter to the panel, and I've asked for a five-year plan, Mr. Speaker. They, they are working on that five-year plan, working on the recommendations, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and I look forward to acting on those recommendations. Thank you. We'll Complimentary. Thank you, Speaker. I think Premier, it took a Freedom of Information request to learn the truth. Uh -oh. The panel billed taxpayers for compensation, expenses, and outside consultants. The grand total so far is $526,649. The Premier's new instructions to the panel will push the bill even higher. Panelists are billing taxpayers $750 a day for attending meetings and often for just making conference calls. Even a laundry bill was approved. We need to know how this Premier justifies putting thousands out of work and then spending over a half a million dollars cleaning up the government's mess. Does the Premier really think that this is the way to support the horse racing industry and win back rural Ontario? Answer. If so, Speaker, the no. Premier, the Premier is sadly mistaken. Thank you, Premier. Much, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we are paying John Snowball and Elmer Buchanan and John Wilkinson to do this work. And yes, they have billed expenses. There was an, there was an administrative error. I'd like, I'd like you to hear this. There was an administrative error made in terms of the billing of a, a, a dry cleaning bill that has been. I'd like to hear it. That's not helpful. Finish, please. There was an error made. There was a bill approved that shouldn't have been. The member from Lambton come to order right as soon as I sit down. It doesn't start back up again. The intent is to get it quiet. That, that bill that was approved in error has been paid back, Mr. Speaker. All of the expenses now fall into line with the guidelines of the OPS. The point is, though, Mr. Speaker, I thought that the party opposite wanted to see the horse racing industry on a solid footing, Mr. Answer. Speaker. I thought that the party opposite wanted to see race dates and wanted to see breeders in good shape. That's what we want on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Education. This morning, parents and children at a Col Napoleon in my riding were told that effectively their child care centre was being shut down on Monday. Twelve children and their families are being thrown into crisis over childcare. Parents who have to go to work on Monday are scrambling to find a place for their children. Children are asking why they're going to be separated from their friends. This school and its unlicensed daycare have been inspected by your ministry for the past three years, and no one noticed that an unlicensed childcare operation was going on. Why did it take three years to notice and speak to the school? Minister of Education. Thank you for your question, and, and you obviously uh, have raised some issues around uh, inspection and in child care, and I will absolutely look into that. It's not an issue that I've been advised of, so uh, this is the uh, first time that I've heard about it, but I do commit to look into the issue and uh, see if we can figure out what went on there. Thank you. Excellent. Minister, you have a lot of looking to do. Now, chaos could have been avoided at a Col Napoleon if a few inspections ago, a few years ago, the operator had been told, you need to have a license for doing this kind of childcare work. Now parents are facing this upheaval, they're facing chaos, they're trying to figure out how to pull their lives together, they're trying to deal with their children who are upset. If the operator is willing to move quickly and comply, is your ministry, ministry willing to move quickly to license them? Or, I appreciate the applause, but I have a second part. And, and will you consider giving them a provisional license 
if they meet the criteria so that the children don't have to be moved out of the school. Minister. Thank you again for, for the follow-up. As I said, I have not been advised of this particular situation, so obviously, Speaker, I cannot make a commitment to take any particular next step, but, uh, but I will absolutely look into this. And the, me the member has made a couple of suggestions that may prove useful, and I will ask my staff to look into those particular suggestions as well. Thank you. Question, the member from Vaughan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Labour. Uh, Minister, Ontario's construction industry is an important part, a crucial part, in fact, of our economy. At a time when we need more apprenticeships, more jobs, and a stronger economy, construction companies continue to positively invest in our province. In my community of Vaughan, construction workers play a particularly important role building our neighbourhoods from the ground up. Unfortunately, Speaker, this summer we saw multiple fall-related injuries uh, and, uh, and fatalities in the construction industry. And I also recall, of course, a very serious scaffolding tragedy that occurred on Christmas Eve just a few years ago. Speaker, through you to the minister, with construction workers playing such a crucial role, both in my riding and across Ontario, what is our government doing to ensure the safety of our construction workers so that tragedies of this kind can be avoided? Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, Speaker, and, and I thank the member for the question and his commitment uh, to safety and prevention of all workers. Uh, uh, speaker, when Ontarians uh, go to work, we all want to make sure that they go home safely as well. Yeah. Workplace safety is Ministry of Labour's number one priority, something that we work towards every single day. Uh, speaker, we are working hard to ensure that both employees and employers know their rights and are fulfilling their responsibilities. And therefore, Speaker, we make sure that we're enforcing the law to its fullest extent. For instance, the member mentioned the Christmas Eve tragedy that took uh, uh, about four workers' life, uh, lives. I'm proud to uh, report, Speaker, that our government appealed the decision of the lower court, which had laid a fairly low fine, yes, and we were able successful to increase the fine uh, to the company to $750,000, the largest Thank in you. Canadian history. Thank, Thank you, you Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for his answer and also for his uh, continuing energy on this particular file. It's very, very important for my community, for the industry, and for our entire province. And I am glad to hear that the Ministry of Labour and the Minister is focused on ensuring the safety of workers on construction sites, particularly in relation to falls. Speaker, it is important that we continue to take these kinds of proactive steps to prevent avoidable accidents. Both my constituents and all people across our province should know what kind of measures they themselves can take to keep our construction workers safe on the job. So, Speaker, to the minister, could you please speak to the two blitzes that you've mentioned and explain how these types of initiatives will benefit workers in our construction industry? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. The Ministry of Labour, uh, as the member uh, alluded, will be conducting a blitz on roofing awareness and fall hazards in the construction industry. These blitzes will focus on worker safety at heights and take enforcement action against those who fail to adequately train and protect our workers. There are many ways to keep workers safe at heights and prevent them from falls uh, through floor open covers, travel restraint systems, and fall arrest systems. Enforcement during the fall hazard safety blitz will primarily focus on the implementation and effectiveness of these varied solutions. We will also be checking uh, that workers using fall protection equipment have adequate training as well as ensuring that guardrails and covers are adequately maintained to ensure that they are protecting workers Answer. properly. Uh, speaker, with these safety mechanisms in place in construction sites across Ontario, we believe we can make a difference in reducing injuries in our construction sector and ultimately save lives. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. The member from the PM Carlton. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Uh, despite telling us last spring that the uh, reopened teachers negotiations from the legislative contracts wouldn't cost us anything, yesterday you actually admitted that after fiddling with those contracts that there would be a new uh, cost, but you had no idea what it actually was. You said, and I quote, and I quote, I want to get the accurate numbers, so you quote, struck an implementation cost estimate working group. Minister, that's why I asked the auditor to intervene. Uh, yesterday and the day before, a senior education source told the Toronto Sun 
twice that the estimated cost could be as high as $500 million. I've publicly estimated anywhere between $300 to $500 million once the union demands for Me Too clauses are implemented. So, Minister, my questions are this. Uh, why did you tell this House last spring that the enhancements were savings when yesterday that you admitted what we knew all along that was going to cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars? And what kind of minister during deficit Question. finances goes out, gives massive payouts to unions without knowing the true cost six months ago and then are not Thank still you. knowing what the true cost is today? Yeah. Yes, thank you. And, and uh, could we just clarify what the situation no, is here? In the when, when in January we announced the savings that were related to the 2012-2014 collective agreements, we announced that the savings were $1.8 billion. That continues to be the case, which is what I have consistently told you. We have found a. We have found. We have found since January some additional savings related to the collective agreement, and that is the money that has been directed towards the enhancements. She just told you. I just told you when we found additional savings. They were, when Order. we found additional savings, they were Answer. corrected. The important thing here is we have classroom peace because we agreed to have discussions with our partners. Thank you. Supplementary, and before you move on, um, I, I would like to remind everybody the questions are put through the chair and the answers are put through the chair, which avoids some of the heckling responses. Thank you. I, I can't really appreciate that clarification. I feel as though I may have been misled, as is the public, given the responses that we have received. Withdraw, please. I will withdraw, Speaker. Clarification is very is passing strange. I don't know how you can have $1.8 billion in savings and then increase people's gratuities at retirement, at maternity leave, and at sick leave. Yeah. But we, once again, the minister admitted to us yesterday in this House that she actually has no idea uh, what the costs were this spring when she had a union giveaway to who I quote as were her friends. She has refused to provide me and this House with details after numerous questions, letters to her, order paper questions where I asked specifically for her to out outline the $1.8 billion Here's in savings up, and to outline exactly what those added costs were. She From has Cambridge said that she come had to order. in the education sector, yet we know that boards are still Question. unable to sign agreements with the unions. So back to her, Minister. Why have your friends in the unions continue to obstruct local processes, even though you have given them exactly Thank what you. they want at a cost we have no idea? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Education. Yes, and I, I'm pleased to tell you that as we uh, had discussions with our partners, we absolutely had cost estimates at every point. The school boards challenged the cost estimates. We put together a committee to look at it. And in fact, our cost estimates were entirely uh, reasonable. And in fact, we often found when we got the information from the school boards that the estimated that the actual costs were less than the estimated costs. Oh. So the uh, the it is to the advantage of the taxpayer, I would say, that we have worked through the uh, implementation committee process because in identifying the true cost, Answer. we have actually found further savings. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Question. The member, the member from, the member from Temiskimi, Copper. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. The Liberal Budget Cut Seminar resulted in the cancellation of the live trapping and relocation of nuisance bears and left people with a 1-800 tip line instead. Over the summer, there have been several near-fatal human bear encounters across the north. Northerners feel abandoned by the ministry and don't even bother reporting problem bears anymore since the ministry doesn't offer any physical assistance anyway. In a recent news release, the minister stated that, I quote, the ministry is currently in the process of reviewing more effective options, end of quote, for, new, for dealing with nuisance bears. Could the minister tell Northerners what those options are? Minister of Natural Resources. 
Thank you, Speaker, and I uh, certainly appreciate the question uh, from the member, and the uh, member is well aware as a northerner, as am I, of the ongoing challenges. And uh, from year to year, depending on the specific circumstances in northern Ontario, whether there's food availability, uh, with respect to the number of bears that are harvested each year, we have different circumstances in different communities. And in some communities, we have more prevalent issues than others. And we've worked with those communities to ensure uh, that we are uh, giving them the assistance they need when it comes to uh, supporting them uh, and identifying their problems. In fact, we have spent more money than any other jurisdiction in North America on our BearWise program, about $34 million to date, helping and assisting communities right across northern Ontario. But I certainly do acknowledge, with respect to the members' uh, comments, that there are some communities in northern Ontario that are facing significant uh, challenges around nuisance bears, and we're committed to working with them to Thank find you. more effective solutions. Thank you. Supplementary. Once again, to the Minister of Natural Resources, Northerners have been forced to protect themselves against nuisance rogue bears. And for those who aren't equipped to do so, their option is phone a friend. <laughs> or in a life-threatening situation, or in a life-threatening situation, call the police and then the municipalities pay the bill. Because of this government's inaction or action, bears are increasingly seen as pests and marauders instead of the majestic animals that they really are. Speaker, does the minister believe that ignoring rogue bears is good wildlife management, and is he willing to continue to put northern safety at risk? Thank you, Speaker. And uh, absolutely, we are not interested in seeing anyone at risk. Public safety is paramount in these circumstances. What I think uh, the member should be aware is that uh, at the time the uh, Conservative Party cancelled the spring bear hunt in 1999. Uh, we introduced the BearWise program, and we also extended the fall bear hunt so that relatively the same number of bears would be harvested uh, each year. In fact, uh, just uh, the other day, I received an email with respect to uh, Mayor Politis and Cochrane and the members uh, riding with regard to a nuisance bear. And, uh, the information that I have is that our uh, bear technician, uh, they've set up a trap uh, with a, a with respect to this nuisance bear, who the OPPA have identified as being a significant problem. Answer. Our folks are out there responding where appropriate uh, and when they're being uh, called to do so. But I'm uh, certainly interested in working with the member opposite Count. and other northern members uh, Thank to you. find ways to more. New question, the member from Oakwood, just mark them. And my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Our government has put together a strong plan to help people across this province, a plan that will create jobs and give all Ontarians the chance to succeed. One of the key elements in our plan is to work with businesses and renew support across a variety of industries. Your ministry recently announced its renewed support by extending the Ontario microbrewery strategy for two more years to help create jobs and expand the industry. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, could the Minister please inform this House what this government is doing through the Ontario microbrewery strategy to help small brewers explore new marketing, training and tourism development opportunities across the province? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Oak Ridge as Markham for her great question. I'm pleased to inform the House of a recent funding announcement of $1.2 million in annual funding our government has made to renew the Ontario microbrewery strategy from 2014 to 2016. This will help Ontario craft brewers better market and raise awareness of locally made lagers, ales, pilsners, Porters and the all important stouts. A little, <laughs> Let's hear Mr. Stouts. Speaker, these are brewers like Steam Whistle, Mill Street, Muskoka Brewery, and Flying Monkeys Craft Brewery. A little known fact about these brewers is that they are the largest purchaser of Ontario grown hops. And this investment will help the craft beer industry right down the supply chain. By extending funding for the microbrewery strategy, our government will help to support the success of this important industry. And this funding will not only support Answer brewers themselves, but will lead to many spin-off jobs these brewers create through their success in local agriculture and the hospitality Thank industry. Thank you, 
Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. This is really exciting news for craft brewers across the province, and especially in my riding of Oak Ridge's Markham, as we are host to a thriving brewery, the King Brewery in Nobleton, which I'm sure this House will be excited to hear recently won a gold medal in the Keller beer category and a bronze medal in the Bach traditional German style category at the 2013 Canadian Brewing Awards. Ensuring that flagship sectors in Ontario like these continue to see support from our government will only keep our economy diverse while creating jobs for the future. Mr. Speaker, on the day before Toronto Beer Week kicks off, when many of these craft brewers will have a chance to showcase their fine brews, through you, could the minister update the House on just how big the craft beer industry is in Ontario? Question. Thank you, Minister. Well, that's a great question, and I thank my colleague for the opportunity to speak to it. Over the last eight years, the pace of growth in the craft brewing industry has accelerated with nearly 45 percent growth in sales, in fact leading uh, sales of all products in our LCBO stores. Uh, nearly a thousand people across the province are directly em employed by craft brewers, that's 20 percent of all the people in that sector at over 47 microbreweries around the province. This industry is gaining such momentum that in 2012 Niagara College offered Canada's first brewmaster and brewery operations management program program, and everyone in the first graduating class found industry jobs. Mr. Speaker, this doesn't even begin to tell the story of the spin-off jobs created across a, a variety of sectors, including agriculture. Ontario craft brewers highlight a real made-in-Ontario success story, Answer. something we can all be proud of as we continue on the government's path to creating a fair and prosperous Ontario. Thank you. New question. A member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Uh, speaker, my question is to the uh, Minister of Natural Resources. Ministers of Families that live in Rondo Park, a chartered cottage provincial park since 1894 in my riding of Chatham, Ken Essex, have been told that they'll have to find a new home in 2017 and tear their cottages down at their own expense. Minister, these are hardworking Ontarians that expect to keep their homes and continue supporting their community while doing so. Instead, they're being threatened with the loss of their unique heritage community because the government has decided the park needs to be returned to nature with little evidence to back up their claims. Minister, we need to work together. Will you listen to the families of Rondo who have spent generations as stewards of this beautiful park and allow them to either purchase their property or at least Question. agree to extend their lease agreements? Thank you, uh, Speaker, and uh, certainly uh, pleased to, to have the question today. And uh, member from Chatham, Kent Essex, has uh, given me another letter today, which we will be uh, taking a close look at. And the member opposite knows uh, full well we've had a number of discussions on the matter, and our ministry is very actively engaged on this issue. We want a positive resolution to this. The, uh, the member also knows that in 2010 we released a policy to propose extending the leases to 2038. Uh, there was some strong polarized views that, that uh, came into play, and there's been a number of uh, reviews around the ecological uh, integrity and the natural habitat of this park to ensure that that's maintained. But I want to uh, assure the member opposite that we're committed to finding a positive resolution here. We certainly respect the uh, cultural and historic significance that these individuals uh, yes, and organizations in the area uh, have uh, with respect to Rondo and these leases. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Minister, I believe that there is an everyone wins solution here. Rondo Park, Ontario Parks, Chatham Kent, leaseholders, the environment and the economy. Minister, they all win. Families will be able to reinvest in their homes with confidence of tenure behind them. You and I have had, passed, have had many uh, discussions, as well as your predecessor, Minister Gravel. Uh, we've discussed options with regards to this, and I've also asked the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport uh, to grant the heritage designation that this park and the cottages so rightly deserve. And instead of destroying the uh, local ecosystem with an extensive teardown, the park gets to keep its proud stewards while giving up less than 1% of its area. Minister, I ask you, will you endorse this crucial project Question. for Rondo families? Okay, Minister. 
Thank you, Speaker. And, you know, and again, I say to the member opposite, we're committed to finding a positive resolution to this. With respect to the designation uh, of the area, as the member also knows, that is a function of the municipalities. But we do have guidelines and standards when it comes to provincial property and uh, provincial parks. Again, I want to say to the member opposite, Speaker, we're committed to finding a positive resolution that helps to protect the cultural, historic significance that uh, these residents have enjoyed for many decades and, and generations, in fact, as well as protect the natural biodiversity of, of this park. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member, the leader Mr. of the Minister. third party. My question is to the Minister of uh, Long-Term Care and Health. Uh, the, in the budget, the Liberal government claimed that mental health is a top priority, yet it's cutting mental health beds at Pro Providence Care in Kingston and firing 70 nurses, housekeepers and food service workers who care for vulnerable patients in their time of need. Can the minister please explain to mental health patients and their families in Kingston how cutting beds and services will improve the care they receive? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, I assure the member opposite. And I think I think she knows this, that our government is very strongly committed to providing improved services for Ontarians with mental health challenges. Speaker. Part of our commitment to mental health is building up supports in the community. That is where the greatest need is, Speaker, and when we do that right, when we support people to live independently, we can close beds in institutions where they previously have been residing. Speaker, we have almost doubled spending uh, for community-based mental health services, and uh, we're serving more than 500,000 Ontarians uh, in community mental health and addictions programs every year. Answer. Speaker, we, we must provide 24-hour care for those who need it, but when people can be supported in the community, Thank that you. is where we will be supporting them. Well, well, Speaker, I find it odd that the uh, I find it odd that the minister is uh, relying on a twenty more than twenty year old study done by the Harris government when it comes to hospital restructuring. Uh, I think the people in Kingston deserve much better uh, than uh, than information based on uh, studies that are done over two decades ago. The Premier's commitment, however, was to expanding access to mental health services, and that commitment is ringing very, very hollow for the people of Kingston, because this government's actions don't back up its words when it comes to the looming cuts at Providence Care in Kingston. Now, is cutting mental health care beds and laying off nurses this government's idea of transforming health care in Ontario? commitment to transforming health care is to provide people the care they need where they need it, Speaker, as close to home as possible. And because of changes in our understanding of mental illness, Speaker, we are able to care for more people in the community. I do not think people should be in institutions when they can be cared for safely and productively in the community. I do believe the members, members opposite believe in community-based mental health programming, Speaker, and that's exactly what we're doing. And when we have successes in the community, Speaker, it does reduce demand for institutional-based care. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on a motion by Mr. Malloy on second reading of Bill 95, an act to establish a financial, financial accountability officer. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
The members take their seats, please. All members take their seats, please. Members, take their seats, please. I see a lot of friendliness going on in here. <laughs> on September the 11th, Mr. Malloy gave a second reading of Bill 95. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Garretson. Mrs. Jeffrey. Mrs. Jeffrey. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Madame Mayer. Madame Mayer. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. Peruzza. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mrs. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Overlap. Mr. Overlap. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Ms. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Besson. Mr. Besson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Madame. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. We won't need MPPs anymore. Pursuant to order, deuxième lecture de projet de loi. Keep forgetting that part. Pursuant to the order of the House dated June 5, 2013, the bill is referred to the Standing Committee on Legislative Assembly. There are no deferred votes this afternoon. I uh, I will recognize a point of order. Point of order from the member for Man. To uh, for the uh, in support of. Uh, the campaign for bullying, uh, standing up against bullying today. I want to thank all the members that took the initiative of doing so. Not a point of order, but uh, since there are no deferred, further deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.